Welcome everyone to System Thinking Ontario, September 2024, and we're here to launch a new book that just came out. Um, and so the name of the book is Seeing, a Field Guide to the Patterns and Processes of Nature, Culture, and Consciousness. And we have Lynn Rasmussen uh, from Hawaii in Maui and her compatriot, uh, Laura Civitalo. And we're going to um, have a conversation today about the book, uh, pretty open. We're going to just um, have people, um, uh, well, we'll have, we'll have a little bit of discussion about the book and we'll have people ask questions. Um, so uh, for those of you who are just joining, um, if you could type in to the meeting chat uh, where you are physically and um, what your interest in system thinking is, if you've been out for a while. Um, I know Lynn from the uh, system sciences community. And so uh, long time um, involvement in the system sciences and I know some of the history, um, but uh, let, let, let's do a fun thing. So um, let's do, uh, how about if uh, Lynn, you introduce Laura and Laura, you introduce Lynn. Oh, that's oh. fun. Oh, <laughs> Laura and I uh, started, uh, we're friends because we were part of a writing group. And I realized I was listening to one of the finest writers I'd ever heard. And shortly after we started walking and every Monday morning, we've walked for 25 years. 25. Yeah. And so we have this ongoing conversation. We walked and talked through Japan, through Kyoto last year at exactly this time. So I've been studying system science for that since 1999. Um, I met David through the years at, I, at International Society for System Sciences. And I've been involved in ongoing conversations outside of just with Laura, um, with, especially with Zoom for, um, for years and years on various systems processes. I'll describe what those are and that, so. Oh, I'll tell people about you, though. Oh, oh, I was talking about me because I'm so. <laughs> oh my God, I have to tell you about her. Uh, she's a poet. Uh, she's a musician. She ran a radio station, a youth radio station, for 18 years, um, and uh, she sets me straight. I don't get away with saying anything that is too academic or jargon written, I have to nail it. And there's no mercy until I do. Or I just question you just to yeah. kick it around. Yes, very yeah, much. Because I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, okay, I'll introduce Lynn. Yes, as she said, we're very old friends. Um, we're excellent uh, partners in all kinds of things. And um, Lynn got me involved in the youth center here where I spent um, the next almost 18 years, so much of it with our friend Peter Swansea right here. And Lynn um, was one of the founders of this uh, youth center. And that was kind of as you were getting in before you were really involved in system science and studying that. But as you were studying that, you were still on the board. And as I was coming in as an employee and to build this uh, little radio station and run it as a youth program, Lynn was um, suggesting a systems-based design process for this organization. And um, no one really knew what that meant other than it was trying to kind of kick apart a top-down hierarchical situation. And those things are very, very stubborn. They are so old, those structures of how things are done. But I do feel that because Lynn had um, suggested something that maybe people had to think about a little more, the, what that did for me was it gave me more freedom to design my own program and to respond to youth as they came to me, to be able to adjust and change the program 
in response to whoever that particular child was. And we work with kids um, ages nine through 18. So um, that's, that's a big uh, difference in development. Um, so in a way, I felt like it, um, for me, um, got people off my back as far as telling me what this program should be. Uh, fortunately, they didn't know. <laughs> and yeah, it, it gave me more, uh, it gave me freedom. Um, and so I, I thank Lynn for that. And then as we continued our friendship, you know, it was just the most interesting thing we could be talking about. I didn't know what she was talking about. There were so many things that aspects of um, system science that, I, and I think it was a wonderful process because as I asked her over and over to really explain these things to me, she had to define them herself. She had to get more clear on them. And I really think that was the beginnings of this book of realizing that what was needed was like a, a primer for system science, a, a place to start with these basics, which is um, what seeing, the book seeing, uh, I think um, does well at. I think it has uh, laid a foundation for other people to, um, you know, come in and, and see what they think and get clarity and start to recognize these patterns and processes all around them and absolutely every aspect of uh, thought and, and being. So um, we're not done with that. It's an ongoing conversation and um, it's not just a conversation, it's interesting, things emerge. You know, once you see something differently, um, it's more creative, uh, things can emerge. That's what I have to say about my friend, Lynn. Thanks, Laura. Oh, yeah, oh, okay, so Lynn, let's um, go back to uh, the beginning and how did you get into this? Uh, how did the book come about? And maybe now the question is, how do you know when the book is done? <laughs> that sounds like you're going on to a conversation a long time. Lynn? I can't There's... hear you, Lynn. I'll unmute. There you uh, are. <laughs> I have a 25-year history with this. And David, as you know, I, I first got into it in graduate school with Bela Banathy. And uh, he was an educator who asked questions instead of lecturing. He said, select a system and then answer these questions. And, you know... He didn't ask, is it a network? Networks weren't quite on the radar yet. It was 1999, 2000. But he asked, you know, what are the boundaries? He, he asked, you know, what are the feedback loops here? Are they relatively open? Are they relatively closed? Your system of interest. Then I ran into, then he introduced me to Len Troncalli. And all those questions, Len Troncalli then called them systems concepts. He quickly changed them to systems processes. But, um, and that intrigued me. I felt like, aha, between those two, I'd come across something that I hadn't come across before. Um, I had a background in public health, background in nonprofits, um, mostly interested in, in, in making this island work in an impossible situations that we, we're in here, uh, culturally, sociologically, everything, politically, everything, uh, economically, it's a mess. Um, and uh, so that's been my challenge, health-wise, definitely. So through the years, you know, I learned more and I learned more. I applied it. I applied it in a, in a coaching practice. I didn't tell people I was applying it, but I was continually applying it. I applied it at the youth center. I've applied it in nonprofits that I've been chair of, you know, president of through the years. And then uh, once COVID hit, then there was a point where I broke my leg and I was sitting there and Janet Singer and, and uh, Peter Tuddenham and some people were emailing and talking about how we needed a field guide. It was 2018. 
And Peter had just had his, he was president of International Society for System Sciences. And we really needed an introduction. And I went field guide. And I thought I had written a book before I could write this sucker in six months. You know, I had <laughs> 20 years of experience with it. It was really straightforward to me. I can write this. And I knew what was needed. I knew I knew some professor types in academia who really needed an intro. They were using um, thinking in systems, you know, I mean, uh, 1986 book. Uh, they were using, they didn't have a good introduction. Uh, six years later, the process was difficult. Laura was right there with me. Um, my husband was right there with me. He had to hear me read it over and over and over again. And the world changed while I was writing it. We went through COVID. I realized I was not writing it for those professors anymore and for those graduate students. I was writing it for the world, that people really needed this, this view, that it's pivotal to the future that it's, it's, it actually describes a future of seeing how politics, economics, religions, how, they're, how they really work, not how, you know, it doesn't divide the world in the same way that we're used to industrially. It doesn't divide people into mind, body, spirit. It doesn't divide cultures into economics, politics, whatever. It's a different worldview. If we can see what a healthy system looks like generally, what the processes are, then we can design better ones. Nature's been doing it for a billion years. You know, systems have been organizing themselves. If we can see that more clearly, then we can better organize ourselves. It's really, this is the science of this century. It's really grown. It's now 1924. It's really grown and it's emergent. It's emerging. I feel like Len Troncalli, I know Len Troncalli was 50 years ahead of his time. People didn't understand what he was saying. And he outlined the basics of the science really early on. And he saw it. Um, see, by the way, Laura came up with the title for seeing. I was saying seeing system, seeing this, seeing that. And she said, just seeing. And she was very right. Anyway, that's my soapbox. So it took me, I, and then I, um, it took me a year of working. Then toward the end, I was working with a, um, an editor who was for 10 years, she was a senior editor at um, Penguin Random House. She's a serious, um, serious person who lives in Manhattan. She's wonderful. And she was, Marie was amazing to work with. So, and then, and then, so I went through the, the, that process and um, decided really, I, I did have opportunities to publish with different publishing groups, not any of the big ones, I'm not famous, but um, I would definitely went with, with self-publishing. 40% of the uh, bestsellers on the New York Times list right now in nonfiction started as self-published books. So it's just how all books start now, you know, unless you're Obama's or something. But as far as the process went, you know, chapter by chapter and the rewriting and the rewriting, and sometimes Lynn would take a hard left turn <laughs> and go down some hole and then send it to me and to me if you say no. No, <laughs> yeah. no, that's, that's exactly where, where did you go? Where yeah. did you go? Yeah, it's the information funny because now afterwards, um, well, this is what we say because we've been in this conversation all these years, it seems so obvious to us, <laughs> and and yet, um to communicate it to people, even when I, when I try to explain to people and they say, oh, what is it? Um, I, I think we're still getting statements down that can uh, at least clarify what it's about. You I know. practice on everybody now, you know, yeah. if you're delivering something to my house, you might get practiced on. You've been warned. 
And I, <laughs> I, I've gotten better and better at it um, because people respond with, oh, I'm really interested in that. Oh, I've been thinking that way in a lot for a long time. Or they respond with, you know, some kind of connection where 20 years ago, nobody knew. I could have been talking from Mars. First of all, I couldn't express it as well. And secondly, the culture wasn't mo not ready for it. I mean. Well, a lot of the terms are common. Yes. You know, well, their terms are common terms. Like, yes, we know what feedback is. We know what information is. Mm. We know what boundaries are. Um, yeah. But Networks. not the way they all work together. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back to the screen sharing again, and I'm going to share the uh, the content so that we have a point of reference to uh, to share a little bit here. And um, the question um, is: As a field guide, do you um, do? You, is this a book that you read from like beginning to end to top to bottom? So you you have parts in the book and then you've got it. So how about a field field tour of the field guide? How how do we go through this book? Okay. I have friends who love it and have read it from page one through the end. I wouldn't necessarily advise that. It's kind of like picking up an Audubon guide to the birds and reading about each bird or something, you know, even though there aren't as many birds. I would consider first reading that, you can read the introduction and read chapter one because it's an overview of what the science is. Then I would consider, then the next chapters, part one through part seven are different system processes. That's a generalized term for self-organization, network, hierarchy, Information, by the way, is a process in my book. It's not a thing. Uh, feedback, power law distribution, boundary bonding, energy processes, flow, entropy, emergence, chaos, self-organizing, critic, self-organized criticality, cycles, fractal states, state transitions. Under each of those, it's like a laundry list. As my my when my editor first saw, saw it, she said, "This is a series. This isn't a nonfiction book. This is a series of." PowerPoints. And I said, yes, 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 it's a field guide. So it starts with, and in each of these start with an introductory paragraph, a definition, it moves to um, lists of examples, lists of definitions from other places, and what they're also called in different, different places, different disciplines. And then it goes through the features and functions of each one, and then it goes through the models. And then it has a few examples of how it ties together with other system processes. You can start and you can read through each one, or you can skip. And I would go, I'd skip down to part eight and read, see, read the part that says seeing whole systems, seeing nature, seeing consciousness, seeing culture in a different way, seeing now. Um, then as you see these things, you can read back and look at them and start to apply them. Um, I didn't put, it was interesting, I didn't define the science or define systems or even define systems processes in any kind of depth until after, after I described each of these system processes. It's because the system processes themselves are not that new. Once you get into them, it might blow your mind a little bit for where they are, but they won't, they will be familiar to you because you're made up of them. You use them every day. The world is made up for them. They will be familiar patterns. But um, if I introduced it, you know, in detail at the beginning, you'd go, huh? And I think afterwards it kind of ties it together. And I just define systems a bit differently. Again, I give an introduction to it, a definition, and then various definitions of what is a system from various groups and places. Um, again, I did it later in the book because my definition is systems are, are interacting networks of system processes. Um, and you certainly can understand what that is unless you've 
kind of gone through this and seen how they work together. Um, that's that's a quick, that's an overview of the book, I think. And how what it works. the book does, though, to me is it it allows you to see the world as alive and constantly moving, um, as opposed to things that must be just um, accepted. You know, say say we think of boundaries, you know, even the word might indicate a hard thing, a boundary. And yet a boundary is ever moving, opening, closing. If it remains closed, the system will die. And that can be a metaphor or, or an absolutely um, specific scientific observation. But the book itself, um, I think even when we say more than patterns, processes, um, you know, just to me to see this way, everything seems much more malleable, which is uh, a more inspired way to, uh, to go about life rather than thinking this is an object, this is the way it is. Um, yeah, that's what I find so inspiring about it. It's very Buddhist in the way that it's it's it. I put patterns and processes in the in the title only to make it simple for people. Uh, it's really a field guide to the processes. The patterns are actually patterns of interactivity. Everything's continually forming, including hierarchies, including networks, and and throughout nature. And, and information, like I said, was the most difficult chapter to write. Information, is, and by the way, this is a science. Each one of these can be modeled. You can model them all in NetLogo or a number of different pro programs, a, you know, a school child could. Um, each one of these processes can be easily modeled and they're certainly applicable. It really is a science. Um, but it's a science of everything, nothing specifically. And it's a science of movement and change. Um, and that takes us into a different worldview, like, like Laura said. It takes us away from the thing world, the mechanical industrial thing world where things are divided up in certain ways and we're trained to see them that way into looking at holes in a different way, um, into seeing how things organize themselves to become and how they are all becoming. You know, one of the things that I say in the very beginning of the book is that it was very difficult to, I just in the end compromised and just said self-organization, network hierarchy. Really, I should be saying self-organizing, networking, hierarching. Everything's um, a verb. Everything's a verb. And I say at the very beginning that, um, that Alan Watts in the first chapter of The Way of Zen describes his problem with translation because the Chinese, um, many, many of their words were, were verbs, not nouns. And, and we have very fixed, fixed terms in English. Well, this is such a issue with um, living in Hawaii, you know, where the native language is extremely verb based and so the uh the world view is um in in tremendous conflict mm -hmm. let, let me open up the uh the conversation with other people if you'd like to raise your hand or drop a note into the meeting chat uh, we'll get to you um so let, let me ask the first question because um, as part of the system changes learning circle that we've been focused on uh, we're with you um, and a, a definition that uh, I like from Russell Acoff is structure is an arrangement in space and process is an arrangement in time. And what we've been trying to do is get people to think in terms of time and then space as opposed to space and then time. So I think we're kind of on the same path there. That's interesting. James Miller said in you know his old book, um, what is it, Living Systems? He said, um, structure is a, a snapshot in time. If you put three snapshots in a row of the same thing, you'll see process. Which I'm is just important. reading um, 
Daisy, Daisy's uh, question here, you know, and I always say this to Lynn, I, I feel she's asking, is there a way to reduce unconscious biases, um, likely part of our standard schooling? Yes, I absolutely think that the key to this is that it is taught as standard schooling, shapes, colors, words, numbers, patterns, processes. Super easy. You can teach a child very easily what a network is, very easily what a uh, um, what a amplifying feedback process is. You know, you're running down the hill and you can't stop. You're either going to fall, crash and burn or stop. And that's a balancing feedback process. What's the problem? Cycles, they see them every day. They're networked every day. All these, these things are just everywhere. It's super easy. You know, having a, we talked this morning on our walk, a child book for my grandson, he's three. You know, it'd be great to have one for by the time he's five to say here, you know? We have Francisca raising her hand. Uh, would you like to go ahead? Sure, and it actually it's a fairly similar question to uh, Daisy's question. Um, and it's this, so I feel like in, especially in the 20th century, we've grown to become very familiar with machines and we look at organizations as machines and we believe that we can just break down complex problems into their bits and then rebuild them, you know, sort of the same way. Um, and we all know that's, you know, not how it works with systems. Um, and something you said about that earlier really kind of triggered my thinking where you said it's about patterns of interactivities. And I wanted to tap into that a little bit because a friend of mine says when he he's a consultant, when he consults with clients, he always says, your organization is not a machine. Your organization consists of patterns of relationships. And I really like that because it is not about how everything, how all the different parts work together, but it's really about how they actually, how they connect. Uh, and the value of that connection. And so I just wanted to, he's not a systems thinker per se, but I wanted to play that back to you and sort of hear your thoughts about what you think about this saying of like looking at systems as patterns of relationships. And maybe as a second step, tying into Daisy's question, like how might we teach that shift in mindset? I think, I, I think it's really interesting um, to... It's okay, I can show you networks and I can show you self-organizing systems and I can show you hierarchies and we're used to seeing them separately. But it's very interesting to say, okay, hierarchies and networks are formed out of, I mean, hierarchies in nature are formed out of networks and networks are and of subsystems, systems, super systems. And that, that it's, hierarchies in nature are there to improve the flows and the circulation of information material and energy we have it kind of mixed up we have it as a pirate we have power and control hierarchies too much in our in our thinking um people who manage well like six sigma uh kaizen um all the TQM, all the management, big management systems, they're all the same. Listen to the people, listen to the janitor, open up, you know, become more networked, less hierarchical. Use the hierarchy for its important functions. And that's division of labor, expertise, you know, for increasing your ability to communicate, not to control, but to allow people to more successfully organize themselves toward the function of the organization. Then you start to see networks form, I mean, hubs, super hubs, nodes, that's a hierarchy. You know, that's how they work everywhere. There's nothing wrong about hierarchies. There's something wrong with power and control with human beings to try to control things that are really uncontrollable and that don't operate well when they're controllable, controlled. So. Once you see it, you go, I don't need all these expensive, you know, um, kind of closed systems training sessions. I need to, <laughs> I need to think, you know, I need to listen to the janitor. 
Well, it's, it's yeah. hierarchy is, is a great one to choose because, yeah. you know, what that word triggers for people is, you know, right off the top, you, you see a king in a crown um, and we must supplicate to you the, see the IRS things. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's the way, the, the way of the world, the way it's set up. And this is a very, uh, different definition of hierarchy it's being informed by its lowest levels it's being informed in in the body you know the cells are every single cell is supported through the circulation of the whole you've got to have every cell going or but you know some miss it and then they die on things happen but the function of the whole body is to support all of its cells so it'll be healthy. I mean, come on, let's look at nature, how nature works and and take it as a as a model anyway. So um, Daisy had a question and I'll invite her to ask that again and then Rose and then uh, Kobus. So uh, Daisy. I don't see Daisy's new question. Well, we can, uh, it's in the chat, which will get disappeared. Oh, and so um, I'm up there. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to reduce unconscious biases? As we you just talked mentioned? about that, Lynn. We answered yeah. Daisy's question and she said, great, thanks. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Rose. I thought uh, Cobus was before me, but. Uh... Sorry. Go, ahead. go for it, Rose. That's fine. <laughs> okay. I I was I really like the title, um, and I, I think it's very very good. And I haven't read your book, so I'm just going to make a, a, a just a comment about what it it uh, uh, struck in me. So you've probably heard uh, or similar quotes around what you see. Seeing the unseen is what we struggle with, correct? So the little prince. Man's Search for Meaning. There's a lot of literary books. And that, that's what I started thinking about. Yes. And where that, and I don't know if this is covered in your book, so I apologize. I haven't read it. Um, there <laughs> is the, um, so this then, then I thought about, well, um, we fix our eyes on, on what is seen, but what is unseen what we see is temporary and what's what we don't see is actually eternal more lasting mm. and so again I, I applying it to your your um, patterns and processes um, and I'll give you a direct application in my own life when I don't agree with someone or I I don't understand something now I ask myself what am I not seeing and for me, uh, maybe you cover this in the book again, this has really helped me on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of navigating, um, um, you know, things that I don't know, people I don't know. Um, Fran Francisca, I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly, but relationships, that's, you know, that's another way that people that I don't seem to get along with, why? What is it I'm not seeing? What am I not understanding? So that's a comment. I know it's a bit... Um, literary but uh, i thought um that's great book that, that yeah. the title and what, how you've described it that's what it's resonated with me you know rose as i have been um living in hawaii for 40 years and it, it, in that 40 years has been such a resurgence of um native knowledge uh, the language has returned the, and the knowledge that's contained in the language and what that's all really about is the relationship to, um, uh, to nature, um, the vital survival. We're talking survival. And I think that what you, you're called the eternal, you know, can even be re referred to just in the longer arcs of time that are required to really understand a system 
and the connections, they're not something you can see instantly. There's a, a Hawaiian word, it's kilo, and it is close observation over a long period of time. And this is why people could survive um, on this island, you know, without 90% of the food or 0% of the food, you know, getting shipped in um, from off island was based on uh, a long understandings and observations of the processes of connection. When I first moved here, there were things that I would hear that it sounded like magic. Oh, how did the Hawaiians know that when this bird sang on top of the mountain, somebody might get bit by a shark in the ocean? You know, it, it had a mystical kind of uh, idea to it. But as I grew to understand more, this was the depth of the knowledge that they have. They had, they have, it's coming back. We need to see this way also. It's a short-sightedness of Western thought that's brought us to this point. And, um, you know, when you do see things uh, through the systems, through the patterns and the processes are a great way into that experience of Kilo. That is, you ask yourself, what am I not seeing? And that answer might take some time. You might have to really sit with that. That's not going to, oh, it's this. All good. You know, it's, it's uh, longer processes. And we, we just don't have those experiences, those direct experiences with nature and the way that they had them. And with those direct experiences with land and the nature and of things and animals and, and how the weather mean. works and how the ocean works and all of that, they saw those patterns and described them. And by the way, all the prophets throughout time, religious prophets, now I've gotten to the point where I've I've gotten kind of radical recently since writing this book. And now I can read parts of the Bible and I read whatever, you know, um, whatever kind of scripture of from any 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 culture. And I'm just reading allegories and metaphors for these same patterns described over and over again. And before they were religious. Now they're actually scientific. And what's the difference? And I, I thought, I loved it when Dwayne Hyberson is writing a paper. He's been writing it for about two years and he's going to put it together. It's turning it into a monograph. And I describe it in my first chapter very briefly. He describes science as the observation of regularities, the modeling of those regularities, and then theory as the story is told around those regularities. And I see now our regularities that we've been noting Western, in Western science have been very specific types of things within different types of sciences, right? And our models and our jargons have been very specific. This science is takes, looks at the patterns, looks at the regularities seen in all things, and then describes, models them, and then tells the story of what that is. And we're just beginning to do that. And that transcends all of our divisions, all of our divisions, because these patterns, we are natural systems. Everything we're thinking, everything we're doing, everything we're creating are natural systems, our philosophies, everything. We've made this big fat di division and our division from the earth, the separation from the earth is literally killing us you know, destroying us. And the capacity to see ourselves as natural systems, everything that we're doing as natural systems is the only thing that's going to give us some kind of chance to make it. And the ind and indigenous people have been saying this forever because indigenous cultures lasted a long time. We're a blip on the surface compared to especially, you know, like America or different, you know, industrial cultures and and up and coming 
empires, they only have a 250 year lifespan. I mean, but they're very destructive environmentally to the earth. They always have been. Long history uh, of that. We'll have a question from Kobus and then another one from Daisy. Kobus? Thanks very much, David. Um, thank you, Lynn, for your book. I've actually started reading it already. Um, and I think, first of all, I really enjoy the layout. Um, also, I look at chapter 17 on fractals, which is one of my favorite, um, and especially the examples you you have in your book on, on fractals. There's one on city size distributions, which is really interesting to me. Um, I did my PhD in urban complexity. Um, so fractal geometry was something that Mike Batty at UCL looked at uh, for many years now and applied. So it's, I think this is a really fascinating guide and I think it, it can serve well as a guide for students. Um, but then I just have a quick question for you on, it's, it's very interesting that you mentioned uh, NetLogo. So <laughs> for my PhD, I actually use NetLogo to um, simulate socioeconomic segregation as a complex adaptive system. And it's, it's actually a, a toolkit that's really easy to use, as you mentioned. Um, I was quite surprised and relieved at the same time. Um, and I was wondering, have you applied NetLogo or anyone else maybe on any of these processes in your book? I, I give links to, or I suggest going to certain models in different chapters. Um, another, another interesting place to go is complexity explorables. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, you can look up, you know, you might not always see that, oh, describe it as this is a network forming boundaries. But once you see these system processes, you go, oh, I can use this as an example for this, you know. But complexity explorables is very beautiful. Uh, Dirk Brockman out of Germany did it. He's just a good guy. And I hope to do some work with him um, making, um, he just redid the back end of his website. And so we're hoping we can, we can talk about how to, how to do something together. That's really it's great. Easy. Yeah. Beautiful mm -hmm. I think even as a systems think, I was looking at your book and immediately thinking, how can I make a systems map of your book? <laughs> like, uh, you so know, there's so many. So yeah, I think that that would be an interesting study in itself to have this. I can already see this massive map, um, or even a cause a loop diagram of the old book. I love that idea. But I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. You know that the um, I I hope that it has the potential to seed things. I would like to put um, like we're gonna. I would like to put together on the mount. We have we've started the Maui Institute. And um, I would like to put, I'm, I'm putting together the additional resources from each of the chapters that I have listed just to go on the website and then people can add, add to it, you know, which would be really yeah, nice. That's a great idea. Just the basics for those different things. And then I would like to have, um, I, and of course, I'd like to have some kind of, it's really easy to have a course, to set up your own course. Super easy. I wrote up, we have a Substack um, blog thing going. And I did write on one of them. I think I published it. I'm pretty sure I did about how to learn and teach the system science at the same time. And just get together a group and say, hey, each of you pick out or groups of you or whatever, who cares? Uh, a system of interest and just start answering these questions. How is it a network? What are its boundaries? You know, how is it informed? Um, is it relatively open? Is it relatively closed? You know, is it a subsystem, super system, made up of systems? What is it? You start answering those questions and whatever system you're involved with, it will do things in your head about how you see what you're involved in, no matter what it is. Yeah. So, and then everybody is learning at the same time. It's not somebody, it's systemic learning instead of somebody standing in front of the room, being the expert, telling everybody how it is. No. 
Okay, so um, we'll ask Daisy, and then Dawn has his hand up after that. Uh, Daisy, would you like to speak or uh, talk about your question? I see Daisy. You're muted, Daisy. Maybe, she, oh. Well, I'm reading her question. Is there a, a way and a pathway for a more harmonious, especially when there are clashes, when there are strongly opinionated right ways to see? Um, yeah, it's it's Daisy, we keep going back to it. It's early, early education. It's a different way. One new message. What you got, girl? Oh, she's having trouble with audio. She just mm -hmm. wanted me to read it, and I did, or somebody. Um, I think a really interesting approach is to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna get political for a minute. Uh, if somebody's a heavy duty right wing libertarian. I can say you're absolutely right. It's very, very important that people have the freedom to organize themselves to meet the needs for themselves and others. Absolutely right. It's also absolutely right if you're a far left communist, communist. Yes, every person requires the information, material, and energy they need to live. And we should assure that they have that. I don't see any problem with either one of them. The way we divide things divides us. Mm -hmm. The way we're taught, the way we live politically, the way we think divides us. Either Those, or. Exactly. And mm -hmm. that makes us go like this. Right. Instead of seeing the whole, then you go, look, how can we, I'm going to challenge you, libertarian. How can you have a self-organizing system that assures that everybody gets the information, material, and energy that they need so we have a healthy system. Well, okay. that's the kind of dialogue that, you know, moves moves things. That's right. where relationship can happen. Um, I just have to quote an old friend of mine. He passed away many years ago, but I never forgot when he said to me, when two people agree, one isn't needed. And the worst thing you can have is everybody in agreement because then you have Nazis. I've got the dog now. Oh, she's in there. Okay. Um, then you run into, you know, real problems. So we, we need, we need diversity of, of, we need great design requires diversity. It requires, it, it can go into chaotic processes. It can be all kinds of things. It can be a mess. But the systems we have in place, you know, at the very first meeting I went to, well, maybe the second International Society for System Sciences meeting I went to is probably 2000, 2001. My paper got, you know, an award and they required, then they announced, they told me, I got told the day before and they said the next morning, you're gonna give a plenary on your paper surprise and i gave a plenary on my paper and 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 this guy len duell walked up to me and he said we need to talk you're going to like what i'm doing and len duell had started the healthy cities movement the reason why you can walk through um venice copenhagen cities in europe so beautifully is they have a different kind of process for planning their cities and they've had it because of Len Duell out of Berkeley. He was a psychiatrist and he was a public health guy. And he said, he said, our governments are terrible at design. We need a design process. And he set one up and the World Health Organization picked it up. It's what we need right here in Lahaina that burned down last year. Uh, we don't have, we have this horrible system that divides us, you know, this democratic what we think well, it's, of such, democratic is, it's such conflicting understandings of things it's exactly it's, uh people thinking that land is a commodity 
to uh, appreciate and um, profit from and people that deeply, deeply understand that it is something that you care for so that it cares for you. And those two, um, those two ways are at extreme odds. They're like this. They really are. I, it's hard yeah. to see how that can. It's hard to see, but I believe it can. I believe that we could come to uh, something better. We just can't do it with the current systems that we have set up. We have well, to it comes back to Daisy's question. You know, she was asking how, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know you can't do mind. it by by the standard planning process that ends up in a vote. Uh, you can't do it with, you have to do it a little bit more creatively with a creative design process and they're actually out there. Um, and I, I, I really believe that people need to see whole systems and how they work in order to understand these things. I, a lot of young people see the world very, very differently, thanks to their teachers. There's a lot of great teaching going on in ecology and system. And well, I think just Maui itself as an island with such a high elevation um, gives one a microcosm. Oh, definitely. To really be able to see. It's, um, it's a blessing when it comes to seeing that. And uh, the island itself is the teacher. Yeah. Lahaina, our town burned down last year and it, you know, over a hundred people died. It's very upsetting. And it burned down not because of climate change. It burned down because of just atrocious care of the land, lack of care of the land and the water. Actual purposeful um abuse of it purpose yeah, exploitation pleasing, e e exploitation yes exploitation of the land that started happening in the mid 1800s and and the destruction of the land now i'm looking at you know i'm i'm um on the board of a of a homeless organization homeless resource center and also our we had apartments and a homeless shelter that burned down in Lahaina. And you can't just rebuild. We have to change the entire environment from the mountain all the way down because we can't just build something that'll burn down again. And as it's been sitting uh, mostly fallow, it is healing itself in a lot of ways. The water is flowing again in a lot of ways. Sometimes we're broken. Leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The pumps were broken. So the water started coming back down through the town and, and suddenly these natural things started happening again and everybody went, aha. And the Hawaiians are saying, we told you wake so. up everybody. And they're angry. And so we've got massive culture clashes coming. They're here. And they're here. Let's turn to Don. Don had raised his hand. Hi. Yeah, I tentatively believe, uh, and tentatively because there's so much conflict um, of ideas and processes, absolute complexity, right? But I, I nevertheless believe that we're in the process of, of a big paradigm shift, mm -hmm. probably worldwide. And um, this makes it very, very difficult to to uh, to make judgments about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, you might find yourself intellectually saying, this is what has to happen, and then thinking, oh, but what if it does? And yes, like I heard a, a lawyer speaking this morning about the uh, recent uh, granting of title to um, one of the uh, tribes in uh, British Columbia. And he, he was saying, well, this is all very well, but that land is also settled 
by a lot of people from all kinds of places for a long time. And they've accumulated wealth and a sense of uh, possession and uh, a relationship of their own. Uh, are they going to be turfed out? And um, the people who signed the paper said, oh, no, no, we can manage both systems at once. And he said, I don't think you can. I don't think the law works that way. I think it's all going to wind up in dispute, litigation, and um, tears, right? Mm -hmm. And no matter which way you go, it's not going to be pretty. I see a lot of this starting to happen. And I also see that if you look at nature for your examples, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, conflict and, and destruction in nature. Um, at any at every level, right? Uh, whether you're talking about the the, uh, the living things, uh, forests, systems like that, or whether you're talking about uh, geological processes, and uh, I don't know if we're ready to tolerate all of that, <laughs> and I don't know whether we have uh, any way to get around that. And I was wondering what, right. your, what your thoughts were on that on that. I think it's why they call it complexity. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, not pretty for what we think of as what pretty is. Mm -hmm. We were talking this morning about um, functioning systems and healthy systems and the terms mm -hmm. we use. And um, mm -hmm. I know Len started a whole group, Systems Pathology where he was saying, you know, this is pathological. And I always had a hard time with it. I never quite joined that group because um, one system's pathology is another one's need for breakdown and resurgence. You know, it's kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's becoming quite apparent that we have a species have taken over the earth, the Anthropocene, and that we're acting as parasites and taking out our own host mm -hmm. and so as we get smarter about that i think what's interesting i'll tell you what i i am thinking and i don't know if we're too late i don't know what's happening i think what's happening now is before the prophets jesus buddha all of them mm -hmm. came out of of at the end of empires where nothing was working and they said you're treating the people badly and this is the way people should be treated and and they led away from that governing that power and control and said no more power and control it comes from god or whatever and they outlined this is the way people should treat each other and we should behave and all that kind of stuff I think what's happening now is we have a worldwide empire thing going on that's just really, and now instead of having a prophet, we're going, okay, now we have all these tools. We can model this stuff. We can actually have a science of these mm -hmm. patterns that were always spiritual. You know, they mm -hmm. were all, when the Dalai Lama spoke here, he spoke for a couple of hours, maybe 20 years ago. And I remember right in the middle of it, he stopped and he laughed, you know, the way he does. And he said, he said, people here, they'll say I'm so spiritual. And he said, I'm not spiritual. I'm just talking about how things work. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. he sounded spiritual because he was speaking from a different worldview. Yeah. And it just... And I've begun to think that hearing things like that, well, you know, when you hear things and they sound like truth, you don't quite get it intellectually. You don't get it from this part of the brain, but you get it from your whole brain and you recognize it. That's a spiritual experience. And over time, you'll start to get it here and it'll just be sort of, you might not be able to express it, but it becomes part of your life. It's less of a spiritual experience and it's more what you, you are. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think we haven't had it as an observable science. And now we have it as an observable science. I'm, which is I'm going to a place um, in a few days. I'll be spending six weeks on a volcanic vent 
on the island of Hawaii. <laughs> and I think that is um, a wonderful place to see um, a speeded up system, uh, yeah. you know, from the time of the eruption, which was the last one about seven years ago now, um, the way that nature makes new land there. And the last um, uh, substance that comes out at the end of, um, of this uh, explosion is it looks like cinder. Um, it looks like it's gonna be hefty like rocks when you pick it up. But when you pick it up, it's just as light as air and it is a fertilizer. So the last thing that comes out fertilizes this new moving land and the plants all go boom. Uh, I believe the ohia came first. And um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful place to observe a uh, system because it is kind of in uh, fast forward. So, uh, yeah. you know, to, to observe it in nature um, is something to, uh, you know, think about it in terms of um, societies and uh, entire groups that are at such odds of understanding that you have to step back and that's complexity and it's gonna unfold over time one way or another, but um, Don, you know, what you said about a paradigm shift. Um, yeah, I, I think so too. And what I you said, that. Huh? it's not a short story. And what you said about the lawyers, the, um, the people who are hired by the people who have a vested interest in keeping everything the way it is. Um, the people who, who, um, are extracting and benefit from extraction are classically the problem, you know, the problem. Mm -hmm. And we are that I'm benefiting right now. I'm sitting in my, my mm -hmm. colonial house, you know, yeah. on, on, <laughs> five acres. And I mean, man, is it colonial, you know, it's, it yeah. really For is. What that really means. It's not just a style title. No. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, it was the plantation doctor lived here. It was mm -hmm. built for the plantation doctor and it, and mm -hmm. there's no doubt I am, I am a creature of the last century living mm -hmm. on the last century. Um, and Oh yeah, I sure. Sometimes I recycle some stuff. I mean, I try to buy local. You know, oh yeah, mm -hmm. we have some solar panels now. You know, but that's not that's nothing. That's nothing. That's nowhere. That's not getting anywhere. This, but there are people here on the ground and people everywhere. You know, Paul Hawken wrote in what 19 eight or seven, I mean, 2006 or 2007, the book Blessed Unrest. I wrote it in my last chapter, a little bit about it. And he wrote at that time how he was, he's a environmentalist businessman who was traveling the world and lecturing around the world about sustainability and environmental practices and agriculture. That's his thing. And he'd go all over the world and people would come up to him all excited because that's what they were doing, you know, and they were doing all these things and they had all these practices. And he went back to his office and said to everybody, hey, you know, I want some numbers on how many people are doing this in the world. And he thought he'd come back with thousands, you know, they came back with millions. And that was then. And he it's called the books. The title is Blessed Unrest. I can't remember the subtitle, but it has to be something to do with the largest social movement ever seen in human history is happening. And that was almost 20 years ago now. It's really big throughout the world. And he's talking about indigenous practices, justice, uh, cultural, cultural justice, uh, as well as agricultural practices and changes that people are making everywhere. And it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I, I really think that that this science 
is they're already living this science, you know, thinking this way. It's not this will this science will give them vocabulary uh, as even strengthened models, you know. Um, and and I mean, when those lawyers start coming down the pike, um, indigenous folks, people talking about real design of something that's sustainable in a place, that kind of stuff needs to happen. There's amazing, amazing work being done out there. I'd like to invite people to come talk here uh, or maybe talk on Zoom. Flying around is not that great anymore, but um, about some of the amazing um legal, economic, I mean, ethical algorithms. I mean, cool stuff going on out there. The mines that are alternatives to taxation that are amazing. Um, uh, and I'm hoping that this will, this basic science will provide a, a meaningful uh, framework for articulating this is like that and this is like that. This is the old school and this is a sustainable new school, you know, and what makes it that? And how can we make it more like that? So I'm hoping that. We need fun. shifts in language for sure. Um, a lot of the words that that get used even by indigenous communities, but it is a Western word. Um, say sacred, they'll say this land is sacred. And that allows a lot of people to brush it off into some sort of religious category and say, oh, it's their religion, um, you know, which then they can either respect and honor or disrespect and disregard. But, you know, what they're really meaning by sacred is a is a different thing. It's it's a vital thing. It's something vitally important to the environment, and um, that word isn't working, and it's creating a lot of confusion. So, um, yeah, I think the field guide sets some some foundational language, and we need to uh, keep reconsidering all the words that we used. I said to Lynn today, you know, we called our our thing uh, Maui Institute. And I said, Institute, you know, sounds like such an old school word, so hierarchical, so solid. But I thought this morning, what it really means to institute something is to put it into play. And that is what we mean by the Maui Institute, is let's put all this into play like we're doing right now. Keep kicking it around. Let me, let me inject uh, Melissa in here. There's a question from Daisy, but I'm going to skip over that and come back later. Melissa? Yeah, sure. I could read it aloud. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, what other people have already mentioned about the paradigm shift, which I see too, and I see contradictory forces sort of fighting against each other. And, you know, some of them are going to win, some of them are not going to win. And I'm just, uh, it's hard for me to see how the status quo doesn't just win the war here with the lawyers and the institutions. And they just have so much at stake that they're just grasping on for dear life right now. And it's hard, it's just really hard for me to see. So I'm just wondering if you're seeing patterns or movements or signals that indicate that maybe, um, faster moving, more nimble systems can overtake it or change something about the existing power structures. I'm thinking about panarchy and it really stuck with me, the whole panarchy model of like the faster moving system kind of flowing into a larger moving, slower moving system. So anyway, any of your thoughts on that? Cause uh, you know, it's easy to get hopeless. And I just wonder if um, maybe there's some patterns or signals I'll, you're seeing. I'll, I'll tell you, I, I think, um, boy, that's a big one. That's a lot came to mind i'm going to say the first thing that came to mind was um when covid hit maui you know when the whole thing happened we shut down for how many months laura peter um pete 
um, or, six, eight months. No, it was at least six. Yeah, there was no flights for at least six months. And yeah, then no flights in, year. out. Yeah, and it still took another year for the National Guard to release certain areas that were more rural and uh, potentially, you know, more at risk. Right. So what happened here was we were this little place in the middle of the Pacific who, and we had talked and we worked toward, you know, self-sufficiency with agriculture and different kinds of things. And suddenly we were, we had, first of all, we were hit with the um, biggest unemployment in the country, our, our county. Um, but we had so much food growing here that used to be sold to all these tourists that suddenly we were, everybody was giving away food. There was so much food here. It was self-sufficient already. It's just that we gave away millions to millions of tourists every year, right? Or sold it to millions of tourists. Sold our soul every year to millions of tourists. We experienced, we washed the waters clear. Within a week. Within a week. The baby fish came back. You could see it in the water. We couldn't see that before. We saw, I mean, and those of us who are, I mean, I've been here 50 years plus, and those of us who've lived here long enough flashed back and remembered, oh, this is what it was. And it changed everybody politically. It changed. What do you mean by that? I, it changed like Alice Lee, different people. It changed different people in government very much. Uh, we all went, it's been too much. It's been too much. It changed, people slowed down. They were, you know, we got slammed like everybody else did with an economic crisis. Our housing crisis turned into, a, well, first of all, we developed a high housing crisis because people from the mainland moved here. They figured out they could live here and work at a distance and they were buying it. And then investors were buying up houses like crazy. Everything started getting extremely expensive to live here. And it was a housing crisis. Then when Lahaina burned down, it was a high housing. It is a housing apocalypse, unimaginable. The complexity of the problem now. What it requires is a whole, it requires everybody to be thinking differently and to be reconsidering the water. You can't build in the middle of a grass field that's going to burn it down. You, it won't work. You can't rebuild the town in with sea level rise where it was. I mean, you can, but who's going to insure it? I mean, there's, I mean, it's just like, uh, it's the, realities of the land, the reality of the place combined with the assumptions of the Western, you know, industrial world. Well, what laws. happened, right. Mm -hmm. But what happened when um, on the big island with the eruption, um, COVID here, when you had the groups come together and really go into intense um, uh, food distribution, uh, what we did have, which allows us maybe not to lose hope, which was the question, is a strengthening of community on some levels through um, adversity and the bonds created through that, that new networking of that um, are, are a good thing. They're a good thing. And it's a, like, it's not a short story. Like I said, it's a, it's a long unfolding. It goes way past my lifetime. When FEMA and the Red Cross moved in to help with the Lahaina burning, and by the way, we lost 21 homes at the same time on the top of a mountain on the other part of the island. We had fires going on and out of control in two parts of the island at the same Three time places. because of the winds coming Three. through. Um, FEMA and Red Cross, I was on calls because I was a board chair at this homeless thing, on calls every week with Red Cross, FEMA, the state, the county, and all that kind of stuff about things, what to do. And um, 
they said they'd never seen a community respond the way this community responded, never. They'd never seen how people could provide for other people right away. Let's I mean, they had never let's, seen that. Mm -hmm. let, let's, let's turn this back to the book. And I'm, I'm just gonna do a, another screen share again and look at, um, at how this book is organized in the conversation that we're actually having right now. Um, and so as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking Oh, you're you're you just muted yourself, David. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, we're I think we're in the section of organizing on the edge, entropy, emergence, chaos, self-organized criticality. Is that what is that where you would place this conversation you're having right now? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I would say I'd look at self-organization, networking, and emergence. Uh, with chaos is is kind of what happens in the process of of uh, before emergence sometimes and and um, of course chaos also refers to any uh, it's like karma you can have a, a small action can have unknowable effects and a huge action could really not affect much of anything um, but I would I would I think of self-organizing instead of relying on the current systems we have, network extreme networking. And you know, the thing that I don't have in this book, and I've I put a lot of thought into it is teleology, direction, um, the direction toward, but what we are doing is it is in the book, but it's not overtly in the book, is things are always organizing toward increasing uh, efficiency of use of energy, material and energy to live. It's spelled out kind of in systems ontogenesis, the um, emergence of new systems to solve the problems of the individual systems that happens throughout nature. Francisco, I have a question. I'm going to stop share. Oh. Um, I don't know if I'll be, sorry, I don't know if I'll be able to pose this as a question, but it's an observation because we moved, we talked about linguistics, kind of the book giving a vocabulary for systems thinking. And then we had a discussion about politics. Um, I work in the advocacy field, so I'm very interested in how that works. Um, and then, you know, we get stuck in some of these, that's where you're, the theory of change gets stuck often on like, how do we move from vocabulary to a happening in the world? And just an observation, but one, uh, an insight, George, George Lakoff looks at a lot of this stuff from like a linguistics perspective. And he made an observation that I found very insightful about systems thinking. It's not, it's not the vocabulary. He states that we actually don't have a grammar for talking about systems causation. And so when you have moral debates, which are political debates, they end up being very individualized. So it's all about who's morally accountable. And when you're talking, you raise the libertarian versus the Democrat. They're all talking about different ways about making individuals accountable often. Where what I think we're all trying to talk about is we want to change the system and it's not just an individual. But this is, I think, part of the challenge politically. And um, I don't know where to get to there because it's his point is it's grammatical, so it's wired into our brain. And I know there's different linguistics with different thoughts on that. But um, I, I've i found that very interesting just in the way you try to do messaging as someone in activism or in advocacy publicly. But what you one of you said at the beginning I thought was very interesting because where Lakoff goes is we don't have the grammar, but he talks about how do we structure the value around a noun. So you were using freedom, for example. And so you name there's a polarity in freedom. Individuals, you yes, individuals need the right to do this, this, and this, and we should encourage that. But they also need the system around them so that they can exercise those rights. And if you see what's going on in the American political debate right now, you'll actually see Lakoff's influence 
because what he's encouraging Harris to talk about is exactly that, is the system around the value to try and get at that system's change. Because his point farther in on how our brain system works is the more that one side just emphasizes a certain construction of the value, the more it becomes hardwired and the more ingrained people are and the harder it is to change. So I'm sorry, that's not a question, but it was just that no. back and forth between the politics, the discussion of the polarity and the, well, the vocabulary just got me thinking about that because it's, I find in advocacy, that's where we often get stuck. Over. Polarity is created on purpose for power, right? For a power thing. So it's, it's always been divide and conquer, you know? It's how it's how all the bad guys have always made it happen, and sometimes good guys, through a manifesto of this is the way that appeals to somebody because to a group of people because it describes very well their situation in some way. But it's always incomplete. It's always a partial view. And and it will create division because it's a partial view. It doesn't, I don't know if. The good news is, is I think, I think we can learn. Well, it's really easy to show people these patterns. Really easy to show these patterns and describe how they work together, because the examples are literally everywhere. They're like I could describe this whole discussion in these terms. You know, it's just literally everywhere. The examples are everywhere. It's just seeing them. And then, then, but it doesn't mean we have to start educating people when they're three. I really think that we're all on, we're all right on the verge of that. I think this, this, what I'm talking about makes sense to so many people. They just go, thank God, I'm so tired of politics and economics and the way people are talking about things. It just isn't making, you know, I don't want to support politically what's going on. None of it makes any sense to me. It doesn't sound right. You know, it's not right. It's not going to work right. Um, there's, I think there's a real wisdom in that. And, and I don't see it as hopeless at all. I mean, like I said, in 1999, I mean, the first network, there have been graph theory. I mean, there's been graph theory forever with mathematics and stuff. And that's been network theory, the webs. But Actual, the first network theory papers came out in 1996, 1998. I mean, we're looking at a real new uh, worldview that, well, it's old, it's ancient too, but uh, for science, for science and, and for education, but now we are all networking. Our, our our vocabulary is in the lexicon. We're networking. During COVID, we watched this whole thing spread through the world. We saw boundaries, how they didn't work, open and closed boundaries. We were dealing with that. And I mean, it was just modeled everywhere. Feedback loops and how, you know, contagion. And I mean, it was all there. And, and these terms I'm using were on the front page of the New York Times. I'd never, I didn't see that in 2000 because I was looking. Mm. You know? But now we have an agreed upon vocabulary. Then we used metaphors. I was at a meeting in, at Toward a Science of Consciousness in 2006, listening to Walter Freeman, who is an amazing neuroscientist, describe the three levels in the brain. And a physicist asked him, you know, well, what about the neurological, neural, uh, correlates of consciousness, which was a big thing in those days. If we could just understand how the neurons are all linked, we'll understand how the brain works. And Walter said, well, it's like looking at, um, it's like describing a hurricane by looking at the molecules. It doesn't make any sense. You can't. I raised my hand and I said, I don't know much about it, but an eighth grade level in the future of hierarchy theory, if you understand what a hierarchy is, you'll understand that, that each level is emergent to the next and they're not fully explanatory of the former ones. And if we know that, we don't have to use these, these, um, these metaphors anymore. He had to use metaphors to describe 
how hierarchies work because this physicist and these neuroscientists didn't have a view of how hierarchies work generally. And I'd sit there and I'd listen to these guys talking and I'd say, they don't get this, they don't get this. I went this year, April, I went to, it's now called the science of consciousness and I listened to plenary talks. And the first seven plenary talks when I looked up who the speakers were, each one of them spoke from a different systems processes point of view. Network, self-organizing, information, uh, you know, each one had a different one. And the old timers, relatively older ones, said back in the 1980s and 1990s, I used to like look at it this way. Now I look at it this way. And there it was, speaking in terms. Now, how did they get this change in how they looked at it? It's coming up through the culture. They're taking classes in it. They're reading books about it. But they'll come from a different, each is coming from a different direction. Some are reading about self-organization and, and emergence. Maybe they took some courses at, at, um, at Santa Fe Institute, who knows? Some people are doing feedback loops. Who knows where they took their, you know, systems dynamics, cybernetics, who knows? Some, some are doing networks and they're using the science of these things. And I'm just going, here it is. It's not all put together yet. Not all put together yet, but it's the science is here and in existence, and it's changing how we're seeing things. And it's in the vocabulary everywhere. It's already here. That's what I'm seeing. If if Harris can actually articulate um, what Lakoff fabulous George Lakoff has to say, people will go, oh, thank you. A lot of people would, would go, oh, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll see. Anyway. At the top of the hour, so we're going to wind down in the next little while. If people have questions, um, I'd like to invite you to speak now. Uh, I'm going to bring back a question that um, uh, that came earlier, uh, which was uh, from Do Daisy, but then she had to leave, which was about artificial intelligence. Do you have any thoughts about artificial intelligence and the impact on seeing? Mm -hmm. Well, when I was um working on it, I uh, thought, you know, I'll get on, I'll get on and put in, you know, what is a network and what, are, what should I know about networks? I really Actually, didn't... what you put in was you looked up your own book. Oh, that was good. Yeah. Tell that was what good. happened when you did that. Yeah. That was about, that was a few months ago. Now it's changed. Now they're more accurate. But when I looked up the title of my book, uh, it said, it said it was by somebody else completely. And then just BS about my book. Completely. It didn't tell any truth at all. Now it actually says my name and it's pulling, but, oh, then I looked it up again. I, I asked it again and it gave somebody else's name and it gave another BS thing of my book. Yeah. In other that, words, if it doesn't know, it's still willing to answer. Yes. It doesn't say, I don't know. Now, as far as how, how this worldview can benefit AI, we have the algorithms for selling anything. We have the algorithms for all kinds of processes, all kinds of stuff out there in the world, but we don't have ethical algorithms. And there are people working on ethical algorithms out there. They're asking the questions and they're working on what would an ethical algorithm would be. Well, I would say if you understand what a healthy functioning system operates like, then if you are operating, you know that the only way you as a healthy functioning system can be healthy and functioning is this, your environment is healthy and functioning. 
So you need to be behaving in a way that increases the health of the systems around you and doesn't take away from them. Okay. That means, that means I'm informing and I'm operating ways. I'm, I'm operating ways in the world that will increase the health of those around me. By the way, you can model that. You can measure that. We have the capability to actually consider that and study that using systems processes. Uh, Len was on to something when he was talking about systems pathologies and he talked about that, you know, uh, runaway growth, the rich getting richer with no balancing speed breath. That's an eth ethical process. Every action is an ethical action. Francisco Varela wrote some amazing stuff about ethics. I have a little book that he wrote, a series of lectures. Every action is an ethical action. You're either adding to the health or taking away from the health of others. Now, it's very complex. You can do one thing that can really help a lot of people and destroy others. Yeah, the law of karma, any action, you don't know what it's really going to do. But you do the best that you can at any given time, and you work experimentally, and you and you get the feedback, and then you shift, and you do what you need to do with the best of intentions. Now, those can be ethical algorithms. You can program that. You can make that into code. And there's no reason why that can't be done. I know it's complex, and but Here's me. there's some basic stuff that we can code. Hmm. We're actually doing some work and not the subject for this conversation, but in the system changes learning circle, looking into um, retrieval augmented generation and the new, and as opposed to what's been happening with the transformer uh, technologies. And the net is open systems, closed systems. And so most people are using things like chat GPT, which is a closed system. Um, and then the question is, well, you know, do you actually want an open system? Um, and I'm working on a blog post that will come up soon where I asked the AI engines about whether they had read the design of inquiring systems by Wes Churchman. They all said yes. And it's like, in that case, could you please describe them? And they actually did a good job because yeah. it's a very old text. Um, but then the question of how you would apply that um, and where we're looking potentially for teaching in the classroom is actually then uh, adopting those inquiring systems and using them in different ways. But that, that leads me a little bit to maybe the last question, which is um, seeing and the work of Len Troncali is about living systems, which is actually uh, a different scope from what a lot have done with, live, with uh, social systems. And so within the ISSS, there is a little bit of going back and forth between uh, between living systems and social systems, and specifically, and um, uh, wondered if you want to, like to comment on that, Lynn. I uh, see all systems as natural systems. I don't see any difference at all. Human systems are the difference. The only difference is is we affect them. Maybe we we as a species has the capacity to. Uh, structure our systems and make them and invent things. Um, and that, but still, I, I don't, I don't see, I ask the same questions of a family, you know, about a family as I'd ask about the tree outside. They're the same questions. Is it a network? You know, how does it organize itself? You know, what are the, you know, what's the information? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? Um, how does it evolve? How does it, you know, move through time and space? Um, the same questions are asked of every kind of system. Then, then I get away from the, uh, I have big disagreements with, with, um, with, some methodologies that I see coming out of uh, systems thinkers from my triple S. Um, I, I was a business and life coach for quite a few years. 
And um, I did study quite a bit about management practices and different things. And I have my, I grew up in small business. I have my own thoughts about applications and it's pretty much now grounded in these systems processes. I feel pretty solidly now that if, if you consider yourself a systems thinker, you should be pretty well grounded in, in these processes and understanding how they work, that that should be, um, that should be, or will be in the future, you know, kind of, what you should know by eighth grade. Uh, and that will inform your practice as a consultant or a coach or a person out there in the field. I feel that, um, I feel I have an eighth grade level understanding of these processes, um, you know, 20 years from now or 30 years from now, an eighth grader will know as much as I do now about how they work. And, um, you know, a graduate student would have somebody who was deeply into lab work and doing code and developing stuff would have a much more, you know, scientific, deeply scientific uh, tools, deeply scientific tools. Um, but, you know, sciences, you know, understanding the basics of ecology, you don't need to be, uh, have a PhD in ecology. You, by eighth grade, you can have a pretty darn good, you know, sense of the worldview and stuff. Um, so, but in the, in the meantime, I'm not in the business of trying to uh, sell everybody and their mother about or convert anybody or anything. I just wrote the book and I think it just helps people see more. And I can't, I don't know. I do see what they don't see sometimes. Just because I have this basic education, <laughs> eighth grade education. I mean, uh, that that um, most people aren't privileged to have now yet. Yet. That's how I see it. Okay, so we're at time. So um, thanks, Lynn and Laura. And um, we can find you at Maui Institute. And uh, there's a sub stack uh, if people want to subscribe. Uh, for next month, uh, for System Thinking Ontario, uh, we are actually combining with the Relating System Thinking and Design uh, people, and we will be having a joint session. So uh, keep tuned, and we'll have everyone out for next month. Great. See everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much.